Welcome to the Tech Story Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Katoon. Today's show is brought to you by Active Campaign. Go beyond email marketing with True Automation by signing up at activecampaign.com slash technory. Get your first two months for free on me. Today's show, we've got Nathan Franco. He is the co-founder and CEO of Pop Shop. Like many of the companies that you listen to on this show, you can invest in them on Republic. They're raising an equity crowdfunding campaign. They've got about 134 days left just shy of $100,000 raised, 220 plus investors. I particularly am interested in this conversation because it's a space that I know incredibly well. If you listen to this show, I spend a lot of time talking about e-commerce, brick and mortar, real estate in particular, and the incredible changes that are happening, not just because of COVID, but in general are happening to the space. COVID is accelerating that, which means there's an opportunity to invest and make some serious money. Nathan, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Scott. Give us the pitch. What is Pop Shop? Yeah, so Pop Shop is a flexible retail booking platform. Essentially, what we do is we allow brands or really any user, whatever your vision is, to find and book a vacant retail space right from the palm of your hand. And whether you need it for a day, a week, a month, a couple of years, you can do that all right through our app or our website. And we really, what we're doing is we're taking away a lot of the pain points that have been associated with traditional retail leasing and just making it a seamless process that really um, helps the users and gives them the flexibility that they, they've they never had in the retail uh, sector. So I love a nice brief pitch. And it's, it is not just great because um, it doesn't make it complicated to talk about, but it's also great because usually the business is, is quite simple from an execution standpoint. There's some things that may be complicated and make it, you know, secret sauce that you will perform better and be able to execute on where others can't. But generally speaking, the business is an easy one to understand. And I will kind of go back to those listening to this show and, and kind of rehash that in the first five years of my career, I managed commercial shopping centers. So I literally know your problem, like the back of my hand. And I remember sitting in, uh, I was in a space we had in Minnesota and we were talking to some retailers that were in like the kind of t-shirt city trends. Um, and they, they, they kind of existed between two big box stores. The big box stores had their seasonal sales. And when the seasonal sales came, you'd be like, oh my God, we get all this traffic. And the, the actual uh, lease owner or the, the renter in this particular case was like, listen, man, we paid more money for our lease because of these seasonal sales. And when they happen, we actually lose a ton of money because all the people come to the big box and like rip off everything they have. And by the time they're done, they don't even go into our shop. And I remember sitting there thinking, what a complete misuse of space that like they have in us. And then fast forward a couple of years and my buddy, uh, shout out to Aristotle, Luma started a company called Ellison, which ultimately got bought by Marcus Lemonis. And I remember Marcus Lemonis, as soon as he did the deal with Ellison, they started doing pop-up shops all over Michigan Avenue. And he was crushing yeah. selling these sunglasses. And to me, I think that was when the light bulb went off in my head. That was like 2016. And I was like, holy shit, did I miss the boat uh, when we were talking about all these retail spaces. So I think if you, if you take that in a nutshell and you apply what you just said as a pitch and you look at the future of post-COVID where we're already used to having everything delivered to us and the world is sort of like, a dis, it's like centralized in the sense that the supply chain, but it's a completely decentralized in the way that we operate and shop. This to me is the future. Like, I think this absolutely is how we're going to be, you know, expecting to shop and so forth. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, the exact problem that you guys are setting out to solve and how you're solving it. Yeah, exactly. Well, given that we're a marketplace, it's kind of a two-sided problem we're solving. So one is, you know, the brands who have historically had a big issue with brick and mortar real estate. So whether it's getting locked into long-term leases and not being able to have that flexibility to get out if it's not working or being able to test new spaces and try it out before committing to long-term, um, that flexibility has never really been there for retailers. Um, we've seen it in, you know, the office space, whether it be, you know, we work style, uh, flex workspace, or uh, even in, you know, the residential sector with shorter term, you know, residential uh, leasing. But we've never really seen that solution um, in the brick and mortar world for retailers. Um, and also on the flip side, now, especially post COVID, we've got more retail, vacant retail space than we've, I think, ever had before. Uh, landlords are hurting and they're in a position where uh, they're understanding kind of now the needs of these retailers and 
uh, they're starting to really open up to that new uh, way of doing things. I mean, otherwise, right, what, what are they going to do? They're just going to sit on vacant space and keep losing money. Their interest reserves are dwindling and, uh, you know, that's when defaults are start to happen. So um, for us, it's really about solving two sides of the, the equation. Um, and I'll talk, talk about that a little bit later, kind of like our history in, in really in both sides, in both the retail and the, uh, and the real estate world. I think you make a good point there when you talk about WeWork. I, I really, so like, I'm not calling the average person stupid, but I kind of am. Like it, it, in particular investors, like we all get into this, like it's sort of like you talk, it's like group think, but like times a thousand where something obvious just for whatever reason doesn't resonate until somebody says like, well, look at the logic of progression. You look at WeWork and you look at how commercial businesses operate. And they, you know, let's like set aside COVID because that's going to kind of change the trajectory for everything. But if you look at how people warmed up to WeWork, it really isn't about the space. It's, I mean, I guess you'd say it's not about the use of space. It's about how they built the space and they made it, you know, more enjoyable, um, easier to communicate and work through, uh, less restrictive in the price, you know, how much money you need to put down payments, uh, what the liabilities are, five, six, eight year leases. Yeah. Right. Like, so like, if you imagine that, like that's a logical progression that people would work and do that to me, it makes sense that they would shop and do that. It's like, now I think of like all of these malls that are like, I live in in Glen Ellen, which is just near a, a mall called Oak Brook shopping center, which is one of the nicest, I think shopping centers in in the country, as far as like it's rating and so forth, it's an outdoor mall. I don't know how many people will keep going to malls forever, but I do know that you can have a really nice time eating, drinking, walking, you know, seeing the the colorful, you know, lights and shows and things, Santa comes, all that kind of stuff. But the store should be changing. Like they have all this space. They could create a really unique and cool uh, shopping experience. To me as a consumer, that is more appealing then walking through some like shit mall with half the places lights out. Exactly. I mean, it's all about experience now, right? Us as humans, we can do a lot of the things we do, you know, on our phones, but at the end of the day, when we go out and interact within physical space, we want an experience. So I think, you know, we're seeing, and I think pre COVID we've seen a lot of, you know, retailers starting to realize that that's kind of the secret sauce is giving your consumers an experience. So I think as more, you know, retailers realize that and provide better experiences um, and landlords realize that we got to keep, you know, like you said, changing up the the uh, user base there or the you know the retailers that are in there and offering shorter term and giving giving our customers our core base uh, of, of shoppers a different experience every time I think is kind of the key to uh, to success for for both sides yeah well I mean I agree with you there and I think you're gonna look at covid as just you know, accelerating it's 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 accelerated people's um, not just how they've experienced the world but I think how they view it and like the idea of going back to shopping the way I did before. I like, I'm I'm just going to put this out there. I I think it's valuable from anyone who's looking at your company just to look at it, like, you know, perspective wise, you know, the days of me going in line for groceries or or really anything that I look at as a commodity, that's just sort of shit I need. It's not stuff that I want. It's not, I don't even care. Like I have to have this every single week. Right. So I buy it again and again, I'm going to automate that just like I do at work. Anything that is like again and again, repetitive, I automate. So I'm going to have groceries delivered. I'm going to have, hopefully we had tap room on last week. We're going to have beer delivered, right? We're going to have all these different things. I want to only go out and shop with the exception of like a 7-Eleven pickup or whatever. I want to go places where I know I can pack up my kids, have my wife, go have a nice time, hit the stores, see something different. Like I I don't want to go to the same shithole every single time. And I, I think that COVID has opened our eyes as consumers to be like, yeah, that's what I want. And so now the problem is most realtors, uh, I don't mean realtors, but most, um, I guess, any, you know, restaurants and anyone who relies on on residential and or commercial space, anyone who's in the space of of taking out leases, they never were in the position to have to secure space. And now they are, or they will be, you know, with, with, with regularity, like they might've done a land lease for, you know, eight years or something like that but they didn't have to do this on a monthly basis. So there's a lack of tools to do that in a good way. And that's where I think you guys come in. So tell me about 
your your guys' background and the company background and like how you guys differentiate this so that it's it's as cool as it can be. That's exactly right. And kind of the idea here for us and really one of our core, you know, uh, one of the core parts of our, of our mission is to really create that magical experience both on the landlord and brand side. So if we can make that process of leasing just be as easy as ordering an Uber um, and really feel like it's magic, then we've succeeded. Um, our background, how did we start? Um, really, my, my co-founder is my best friend since I'm five years old. We both grew up in, uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of DC. Um, my family has been in uh, retail for about five generations. And my partner has been in for you know, multi-generations in real estate. So we both grew up, I grew up you know, scrubbing the floors and uh, peeling stickers off the, uh, pricing stickers off the floor. And, yeah. And, in the store. Uh, my partner was working, you know, actual construction at, at an age way too young to be working construction. So that was really in our blood from, from, from the beginning. Um, and throughout school, we both worked full time in, in real estate development. I was in New York uh, running acquisitions and development for a midsize uh, development firm. And he was running his family's portfolio in, in DC. And we had always had this itch to like do something bigger and more fulfilling than just, you know, typical real estate development, you know, and we were seeing kind of what was happening and unfolding in the yeah. retail and we're like, we got to figure something out. Like this is hitting home, right? My, my family has retail stores and an e-commerce business. My sister has her own little Instagram stores and she's always complaining, like she has no way to, you know, do something in brick and mortar. So we really wanted to figure out some sort of solution for, for really everybody. So the landlords and, and the brands were suffering. Um, and that's, that's how we came up with the idea. We're like, let's create a marketplace. So one, we're asset light and we don't run into issues, you know, of like we've seen, you know, other, other companies who are asset heavy and taking out leases. Um, so if we could do that, create an asset light, you know, marketplace, really um, create it so that the process and the product is magical and really just makes life easier for both sides, then we're going to do something. <laughs> You know, we're going to build something great and we could be, we could scale that, you know, really all, all over the world. Um, you know, we've even done, you know, bookings in Paris. I've never been to Paris myself. Um, I'll admit it to, I've never been to Chicago, but uh, we, we've done. Oh, you're missing out. Yeah, we, we've done quite a few bookings there too. So um, that's just a testament to like, if you build a great product and it's uh, useful for users, you can really scale it anywhere. Um, and, you know, the, the way we're thinking about it is we, you know, building the technology, making it better and better. So that way, you know, we don't actually have to physically be there. And I think for us now, where our focus is on really creating just a better product for, for everybody um, is our big push into AI, right? So we've, we've to date built, um, you know, we've built the core machine in a sense, the booking platform. Now, how do we make it, you know, how do we take it to the next level where it's even, you know, more, more magical and, and better and, you know, helps uh, users make better informed decisions and sets them up for success. And that's where, you know, for us really AI comes in, we can do space matching that's based on, you know, traffic data and, uh, you know, type of industry and, you know, the neighbors you want to be around and really help the brand set themselves up for success within brick and mortar. You know, traditionally, a lot of times, you know, uh, when you're dealing with, you know, agents or whatnot, they're kind of throwing spaces at you that, you know, they have exclusives on or really in their best interest for you to take. Um, so we really want to want to position ourselves to help them make uh, informed decisions, help them, you know, be successful in their brick and mortar strategy. You know, we're talking about AI, but technology is really the big focus for us. So how do we how do we make our product just better and better? For example, we, we recently launched our app, uh, which is an app store and also Google Play. Um, so we're really just trying to to make it just super seamless for the users. So we're taking out paper trading, so you don't have to you know go back and forth with on email with leases or you know you make payment right there on on the platform. You could pay you know you could pay with credit card ACH, and we even tied in Bitcoin. So you know yeah. today we're yeah. seeing uh, twenty three thousand. There you go. Now now you can book your space. Keeps rolling, Bitcoin. keeps rolling, yeah. keeps rolling. <laughs> Satoshi takes space. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. So listen, man, I, I, I really, I really like this. I think it's, I love the asset light. Ver, you know, I don't know who you're talking about. It wouldn't be WeWork or anybody, is it? Uh, yeah. the, <laughs> I can't imagine. Um, but, it, but it's so true. And I, I'll tell you, like, as I sit and listen to this and I, I put my like 
tech investor hat on, but I also have my real estate operator hat on. And I, I can't help but think about how insane the opportunities are for you from a layer of pricing product standpoint, because like, let's be honest, the paper trail sucks. The payment stuff sucks. Collecting rent is the worst. And so if you're avoiding all those things from a landlord perspective, and then you also have these legacy leases in place where occupancy trigger certain real estate, you know, tax uh, requirements and, you know, lease options and step ups and all this stuff, right? You are essentially giving them the ability to protect themselves in perpetuity, which is cool. The part of this that I think is really exciting is I try to look at things kind of upside down. So if you were to say to me, this is the market where there's, there, there's a, it's a multi-billion, potentially trillion dollar market globally that is real estate space. And there's people looking at this going, oh shit, man, COVID, like where's, where's uh, real estate going? Like, where are people going to use? And I look at it the other way. I look at this and I go right now, and it's trending, you know, fast as you can imagine, 25% of all sales of goods and services and things are done online. Amazon is 20, you know, not necessarily just Amazon, Target, Walmart, et cetera. They're 25%. Do you think between now and 2025, that number is going to hit 70% or 65%? I personally think it is. But people would look at you at that point and go, where's your business? And I look at it and I go, that is the biggest opportunity in the planet. Because all those e-commerce stores would never take space. Real estate is going to be in deep shit. And I'm providing an opportunity for all e-commerce. We had uh, Monica and Andy as a store here in Chicago and their, their e-commerce store. It's a Bonobo's uh, founder's sister, I think. They do these pop-ups all the time and they crush with them because they create a really cool experience. You're going to be able to basically have every single space leased up 80% plus of the time with all of the different types of e-commerce and in experiential stores and, and bars and restaurants and things, it is going to be like, I don't know if you've been to a, a mall for your Italy, but they basically have these pop-up restaurants just like on the water. You just go there and you just sit down and there's like not even an establishment. Some dude like runs up the hill and he shows up with fucking lemons and you're like, whatever, I'm here, I'm eating it, I'm drinking it. But the, the point I'm trying to make is you're actually – a microcosm of the future of how this works, right? What I love about that is the growth, surely. But what I really like about it is the layers of pricing that you guys have available to you. You talked about your the machine learning and the analytics that you're offering. What I think is important for people listening to understand about that is, imagine if I had a space that I'm paying, let's just say ballpark, it's a hundred you know, a couple thousand square feet, it's a hundred thousand dollars a year. Like that's my liability as the owner. There are times of the year where I could make 12 to $16 a square foot. There are times of the year, times of the day, potentially where I could make 24, 30, 60, $80 a square foot because you can surge pricing and you know, like the traffic. So if I'm a, if I'm a person looking to lease the space, your analytics can tell me it's Halloween you're this kind of customer that's this kind of people, the traffic near it during this time is younger, yada, yada, yada. It, it is the best. It's like matchmaker. This is Tinder for fucking real estate. That's what this is. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, th- I think you're going to like our next uh, our next feature that's uh, on our roadmap. Um, and that's uh, percentage sales rent. So yeah. uh, the idea there is we're building a software that's essentially plugs right into the user's POS system. Um, and Keep, gives the landlord real-time tracking of the sales and pays them out their rent based on that. So now people could come on to Pop Shop, book a space based on their sales without having any upfront liability and being able to really, you know, take the leap into brick and mortar without without inherent risks. It's such a SaaS play. Like I just, yeah. this is one of those things like, and you, like as an investor, I think you look for these and, and well, listen, I'm like, I'm telling you how awesome this stuff is. And, and it all comes down to execution. It's like, right. Like I think the idea and the concept and everything you have is amazing. You guys are going to have to go out and get the job done. And that's where the investors hold on to the risk. But from a concept standpoint, this is, you know, in a lot of ways, I don't mean to keep referencing tap room because we just had them on, but yeah. I literally just wrote this newsletter. So it's like fresh in my head. It is all tailwinds. Are, are helping you in the market and all consumer behaviors are helping you right now. And they're not changing. And your technology play similar to theirs, like while they hold more distribution, they don't have to buy it. 
It's just yeah. as a, they're basically, and honestly, they can actually make money on, on housing the beer that gets shipped to them because they're basically just a, a warehouse at that yeah. point. You don't even have to worry about it. Like you literally could, could sell your analytics to make wiser decisions. Like there's a, a su- subscription coming out of your company just to, just to be a landlord to help improve the bottom line. There's a subscription out there for, uh, you know, anyone who is in, in retail, who's like looking for better ways to optimize their holiday peaks. Like there, there's so much here. Yeah. I'm just, I'm excited about it. So I, I guess my question for you is like, how do you grow this and scale the, I, I understand how the tech scales, but how do you scale this company and this brand uh, and get it in front of all the people that maybe are like, I think you'll really get to like 20, 20 to 30 year old new e-commerce people, they'll get it immediately. How do you get into the people who are currently existing and sort of flip the script on what is the standard operating strip mall procedure and what will be the future? Like, how do you navigate that little tide where we we're kind of stuck in the mature world and we're still going future? Yeah, it's actually interesting you mentioned that because because we have seen you know activity picking up even for you know those class B C type of spaces in you know strip mall. So I think we are seeing people that are even you know above that you know twenty to thirty year old type of DTC yeah. brand. We're seeing those other mom and pop brands realizing that they need some sort of flexibility now. Um, so I think we just need to keep pushing perfecting the product. I think that the percentage rent. Um, idea and feature is really going to be a game changer for those smaller brands, especially for those mom and pop brands who can, you know, get in without having to take much risk. Um, So really, really, you know, it comes down to, and I I like to think about kind of like how Elon Musk thinks a lot and and the way that, you know, the guys at Airbnb think it's about the product. If we hyper-focus on making the product amazing and, you know, again, I keep using the word magical, but when it feels like magic, that's when you want to use it. And that's when you're going to keep yeah. using it. So the better the product gets and, you know, and it's going to use some, you know, thoughtful and, and tactical marketing um, and PR to, to get out there. You know, if the product's out there and it's great and people see it and use it and they fall in love with it, um, they're going to go tell their friends, they're going to tell their friends and it just spreads like wildfire. So um, I was hoping when you said Elon Musk, you were going to do a jam on my show. I wasn't sure. I was, I was hopeful. It's going to get my Joe Rogan moment. <laughs> I don't, um, yeah, we're going we're to skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Hey, you know what? You talked about Bitcoin and commerce. You never know what people are into. Um, yeah. <laughs> dude, I, I, I'm excited about it. I really, I, I love the brand. I have to tell you the pop, I, we don't talk about this in a lot of the shows because uh, in tech companies, there's like this obsession speaking of many of the companies on there like lose the vowel and it's like weird names. I think Pop Shop is a great name. I think you'll have a, a lot of success with brand marketing, being able to get SEO and and that kind of stuff. You know, I, I really do think like you're in a situation where if your tech continues to scale the way it does and you guys have a sound digital marketing campaign, like your real liabilities are, are marketing spend and tech debt. Like that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, that's really what we're, we're raising for is to continue building on tech and to do marketing. I mean, to date, we We've done very little in marketing. We've kind of bootstrapped it all ourselves um, and really done a lot of cold email and kind of just nitty gritty type of uh, outreach um, and zero PR. So um, that's really why we're raising now is one, so we can, you know, really just make the tech better and better every day. Um, and also to get get the product out there. We got to let people know about it now. So um, yeah, we're, we're excited for what the, uh, you know, what's on the horizon. So talking about the numbers a little bit, like, so have you raised capital before? Is this self-funded? Uh, it's self-funded to date uh, by my partner and I. Um, uh, so no, no outside capital. Um, the Republic's the first one we've done. We're, we're now talking yep. to some of these and, um, you know, kind of having those conversations. Some are in various stages of due diligence and whatnot. Um, but the idea here was, again, you know, if we could be as asset light as possible, it shouldn't require so much capital. Um, of course, you yep. know, we need to really develop the product more and more um so yeah that's what that's where we're at now um in terms of traction uh 2019 was was really just awesome a breakout year for us you know we did bookings with over 155 brands um ranging really anywhere from mom and pop brands to um you know well-known dtc brands such as benefit cosmetics or everlane all the way to you know bigger Fortune 500 style companies like uh, like HBO uh, or Neutrogena. 
So really yeah. runs the gamut in terms of the type of customers that we've seen and, and are using in the platform. And you're, so I, I'm looking on the Republic page, which I said at the top here for people who go to republic.co slash pop shop. Um, we're looking at what, 3.15 million in booking volume to date. You guys take a 15% booking fee. So your gross yeah. margins are obviously quite high. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I said about a couple minutes ago, you know, there, there really is an opportunity for you to have a lot of ancillary income and to have price surging and all these other kind of things, which, you know, in some people they'd be like, oh, that, you know, that might not go over well. The reality is it goes over fantastic because I run a business like this. So I know this, if you're a landlord, it's a way for you to offset, you know, slow times. It's sort of like the airline model. Like you, it doesn't matter if the plane is full every time. It just matters that the money makes sense. If it's 12 people, they pay the equivalent of 300. It just matters exactly. when they fly. Right. Exactly. So You've got, you've got the ability to entice landlords as a protective measure. You have the abilities to generate some more money from the retailers during certain peak seasons, but they're benefiting by having the availability of the space. So it's kind of a win-win from a, you know, 2020 traction. I'm just curious, like obviously less people out and about shopping and, and things yeah. like that. What, what does that look like? And what have you learned from that? Like what, I don't mean learn like lessons in life. I mean, like glean from it into the future. Yeah, I, I although think, lessons are welcome, you can yeah. have lessons too. <laughs> it's definitely taught me a lot of lessons in life. But um, yeah, in terms of what we've seen, yeah, 2020 has been you know a definitely a tough year for many retailers who uh, you know are solely focused on on e-commerce. Um, but what we have seen and what we we've been speaking with a lot of retailers and what they're saying is that they they want to be back in brick and mortar, right? Uh, the cost of acquisition for customers in e-commerce is rising tremendously. At a certain point, a lot of these brands, they plateau in terms, in terms of that acquisition, and they really need other means and cheaper means of acquiring new customers. So uh, brick and mortar just you know, makes sense for a lot of those brands. Um, in addition to that, I, I, I would say that it's, it's also a amazing way for those brands to interact with their customers and build that customer loyalty around them. Right. So like a lot of people like me, like, I don't like to just order online and, and just try, you know, the, the garment on, um, you know, for fear that it's not going to fit. I'm not going to like it. And I'm going to have to deal with shipping it back and putting it back in the package. Like I want to go, I want to see it the first time, touch it, feel it. If I like it, then I'm going to continue buying online. I, Cause I know it fits me. I know I like it. It's my company. I'm, I'm with it. So I think that using it as a tool for that is also tremendous. We're now seeing also that a lot of the more mom and pop brands are looking to enter back into the retail world now, and they're wanting that flexibility. So they're going to want to try out spaces for six or so months before committing. Or, um, you know, we're working now with a lot of uh, COVID testing centers that are wanting to open up pop-up testing centers around the U.S. Um, and, you know, they don't need it for, you know, a year, two years they want to have for six months. So we're seeing a lot of different uses too and learning that it's not just brands. It's not just apparel brands who are going to want to be using this service. It's really anything and everything, whether it's doctors, uh, cleaners, really, you know, it, there's so many different applications for it. So as long as we're providing that platform that just makes it so easy and gives the flexibility, you're going to see just so many different types of users. I'm excited about this, man. This is cool. Um, I appreciate you taking the time on here. People can go to popshop.com and check it out. And I recommend going to republic.co slash pop shop, check out this uh, campaign that, like I said, it's pretty early, 134 days still left on it. Um, seriously, Nathan, this is awesome. Uh, congratulations on the early traction and success. And uh, I guess what, what should we expect to, to see from you in the next, you know, as we get into 21? Uh, you're going to see a lot of exciting uh, new technology coming out. That's just going to make, uh, Make really brands and landlords lives easier better uh hopefully bring some you know you know energy back into the economy and uh, helping small and big brands alike yeah all for that thank you so much for taking the time yeah no thank you scott appreciate it yeah.